Hey guys, I'm Jacob. This is the Preppers Bunker Outdoors. I'm here with my sisters, Summer and Zoe. We're at the Rock Castle Shooting Center for Justin Vitito's basic survival class. So stick around and check it out. Yeah, so the first day of this, uh, this course, the big things that we're gonna cover are different ways to make fire, uh, different ways to filter water, and some shelter making. Um, the other big thing that I really cover is priorities and making sure your priorities are straight. Um, depending on what environment you're in, the climate, uh, what, what you have up against you. Um, so being able to think of that in a logical thought process. And I also really push being able to identify, when we're talking about fire, being able to identify characteristics of different wood and things like that. Um, so that if you're not in your backyard and you're trying to make a fire that you can still do that based on the characteristics of a plant instead of just knowing that okay hey cedar does this or whatever you might be in a you might be in a location that doesn't have that particular plant um, so characteristics are a big thing for me and understanding the ideas and the concepts behind particular methods to do things whether it's filtering water or building a shelter or really anything in survival, if you understand the concepts behind it, um, you can kind of innovate and make stuff work uh, that otherwise you would just be trying to do what you saw in a book or on a video or something like that. All right, so the first thing that Justin's gonna talk about and teach is some of the basics of fire. And what we're going to do now is he's having people go out after a really hard rainstorm, everything soaking wet from the last couple of days, and he's having people find the resources they need, and more importantly, find what to look for, even if they're in a different area, to get that fire started. A reoccurring theme throughout this entire class with Justin was he wants students to be able to understand why they do things and not just one way to do that. And when we were searching for wood, he's pointing out what types of wood to look for, not just one certain tree, and how to find dry wood. Um, really overall what you're looking for in almost any environment, not just in the local environment and with say one tree. So Justin talked us through how to tier your wood between tinder to kindling to your full-sized fuel. So what we're doing now is we're going out, we're gathering a bit of cedar, and we're all going to practice doing this ourselves. One interesting thing about the class is that Almost all skill levels were represented in the class, all the way from people who've almost never made fires to people who are quite proficient making fires. And Justin not only challenged everybody to try and get a little bit out of their comfort zone, but he and the people who were there were able to help everybody regardless of their uh, skill or lack thereof. So everybody got as much from the training as possible. water right especially if it's super hot outside or you're doing a lot of work right me and Jacob were just talking he was getting a bow drill going and sweating profusely um, which is really easy to do and you get fixated on something and you got to accomplish it right then well before you know it you're losing every ounce of water that you put in for the last two days. Justin continued the subject of understanding why and how to do something as opposed to understanding a single way to do it with water purification. So we looked at how to make a purifier with a bottle, but understanding the different layers and why they work, uh, he made sure that we all understood that you don't need a water bottle. Whatever you can put these items in, you can use. And he really stressed 
uh, being able to be flexible. So after filtering water and stuff, we've moved down into the cave and Justin's going to talk to us a little bit about cave water and we're going to go check out some cool stuff. As we walked through the cave system at Rock Castle, which is right by Mammoth Cave, they were just amazing. Uh, we talked a lot about what to be careful of uh, in a survival situation with caves for shelter and for drinking water. Going through the caves was just, it was so cool. And not only that, it was really surprising the temperature difference. I mean, it was at least 15 degrees cooler in the caves than it was outside. But I knew that we were not in the caves just to enjoy them. I knew that Justin had something up his sleeve more than just talking about water in caves and talking about sheltering in caves. What we did on our way to the caves is we were supposed to pick up a little bit of tinder here and there, which everybody did, but uh, at this point Justin had us make a fire in the cave. Even though I had minimal supplies, I thought that this was going to be easy, but the cave is so damp and a lot of the materials that were gathered, you know, hadn't stayed in our pocket for very long, so it wasn't idea ideal. And getting that fire started was very difficult, and there was also a time constraint there. So what was really cool about going into the cave is not only were you going into a more challenging environment for making the fire, but there was a little bit of extra stress there and nobody could see really well. And it was really eye-opening for everybody involved. It was a great training experience and heck, it was awesome also just to get out of the heat. So that was really cool. And uh, like I said, I was surprised at how much difficulty I had getting the fire going myself. Part of this class was getting this fire going uh, down in this cave with tinder that we had collected in our pockets, which did not end up being a lot of tinder. Um, and so everybody, myself included, really struggled to get these fires going. Um, I finally got this little guy going. I had to use one of my Beach and Tactical Extreme Fire Kits that I keep in my bottom pocket. Um, I used one of the little wax seal jutes thing, a little bit of twine, but uh, we got it going. But uh, the point of this exercise was to show how much more difficult fire is in an extremely humid environment because a lot of people have never made fires out in the rain and austere environments and stuff. And uh, this is actually surprising to me because although I didn't have the best materials, I did expect this to be a whole lot easier. So uh, this was a very interesting exercise for sure. Uh, day one of the basic survival class with Justin Vitito at Rock Castle Shooting Center um, was awesome. Uh, as you guys will have already seen, we did fire, we did water. Justin talked to us about mindset and shelter. Um, it wasn't really something that I could film because it was really long, um, but it was something that you're not going to get in a lot of survival classes and he understands uh, what it takes. So, I mean, day one, this class was really packed with information. Uh, I wasn't quite sure where we were going to tie the cave in at first. And once I saw how he was using it as a, a humidity example for making a fire with minimal materials, um, it was really, really good. So this class was an absolute blast. So this is day two. Day two, we're talking about um, getting yourself out of a bad situation. So if you're hurt, 
being able to use signaling devices, a bunch of different methods for signaling, uh, making sure that they contrast with your environment so that they really stick out and draw people's attention and say, hey, there's somebody hurt over here, I need to go help them. And if you're not hurt, being able to navigate your way back to a safe place, back to home, back to you know town, whatever it is. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna cover those, those two big things. And then we're also gonna delve a little bit into traps. And my methodology behind traps is I want things that are multifunctional, but I also want people to understand that you have to put those traps in the right place. You have to be able to identify where the animals are going before you start making a bunch of traps. Um, once you can identify what, what avenues those animals are using, then the likelihood of your success on traps jumps way up, as opposed to just putting a trap out in the middle of the forest or in the middle of a field or, or things like that. Um, and then in addition to that, you can use those same, uh, the same mechanics behind the way you build traps to do a bunch of other things, uh, everything from signaling devices to you know, a whole plethora. But understanding how to take things that aren't necessarily designed for something and repurpose them in order to keep you alive is really probably the biggest part of survival. That mentality of being able to adapt to what's going on around you and make stuff work with what you got. The best trap in the world will do nothing if it's in the wrong place. The first thing that Justin talked about with doing traps is finding animal trails, explaining why they're made and how to find them, how to get down on the animal's level to look for these trails sometimes and they might otherwise be difficult to find because it's all about placement. When trapping for food on land, you might get a successful catch one time out of 20 traps in a day. So Justin explains that it's really important to have your traps in the right place and to have them as simple as possible because if you have an ultra elaborate trap, uh, it might catch game the first time it's triggered, but it might not get triggered for 20 days. And you could be very dead within that period of time. So he talks about using simple snares, which is what most people actually do for trapping, is just simply setting out a simple snare. But he does show us this spring snare, which is really cool. And the benefit to that is not only do you snare the animal, but you pull it up out of reach. And um, there are just some benefits to having a, a cooler trap like that. What I was surprised by was how simple it was because usually spring snares are a little more complicated. The mechanism was just great. So what the students are doing now is the final exercise on day two, and it's a culmination of everything they've learned over the last couple of days. In addition to that, they have to work together in order to accomplish those tasks. A lot of survival situations, you might find yourself in all actuality with a bunch of other people. And being able to delineate tasks and figure out who's doing what is also a big part of it because you don't want to waste a bunch of time and a bunch of energy sitting there arguing with each other. Um, so what, what these guys have is a series of tasks that kind of cover the entire spectrum of what we've talked about over the last couple of days that they have to accomplish together. Um, and it covers everything from making fire to procuring water and filtering and boiling it to signaling for rescue, um, trapping, um, land navigation, kind of the, the uh, again, the whole, the, uh, the whole entirety of what we've talked about over the last couple of days 
um, being able to put all that together and work with each other to accomplish that goal. Uh, I like to wrap up with this kind of exercise. It's, uh, it's a, a fun way to get everybody together and kind of use each other's strengths and weaknesses and, and uh, you know, kind of put everything together that they've learned over the past uh, couple days. All right, just say what you did. I uh, made the water filter. And water's easier to filter when you have a plastic water bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, we gathered stuff for the fire, like the kindling and such. What'd you guys learn? Uh, how to get a lot of tinder easily. And it's hard to split cedar wood. It's too big. With the knots. <laughs> the knots are hard. <laughs> What did we learn about filtering? What did we start with and what did you do? Well, we started with a water bottle, but with a small hole in the bottom, it was going to take forever to get enough water for everyone. So we went to a bandana with charcoal and grass in it, which went a lot quicker. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so basically, I just took a sapling up here and there's just a little loop tied around there, around the branch so that it doesn't slip off. I come down here and the trigger system I was trying to use failed so instead of that I took an L-shaped piece of wood and carved it so it sits there well. It's pretty sensitive. Nice. Be so, careful back there. No, no, right. Yeah, I don't want it to come back and hit you in the face. For sure. I do. Part of that. <laughs> Part of that happening before. Um, with the loop, what I did is something. Oh, it untied itself now. If you take this and double loop it, put it on there, it stops it from loosening up once the animal's hanging. So I did that. And I set up a couple of sticks to hold the loop open, funneled it off so that this is the easiest trail they could take. And I would even go further and put a trail of food through it if I'm really trying to catch something. Um, but yeah. So it's a high deadfall trap using a figure four um, trigger. So they come along, there's a little trail that comes through here. It's mostly deer, but it wouldn't work for that, obviously. But they come through here. Oh. Jimbo! And, uh,. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be wiggling on the on the uh, pulling on that hopefully and have it fall on them. All right, I had mine uh, rock strung up in a tree over the pivot of that branch down to this trigger here, and uh, and I've got a slip knot here which the dogs walked through. <laughs> um, so we've got this hidden by some of the ferns. And I was planning on more of animals coming down, funneling them in by putting these branches up. And the weight and momentum of them coming down this hill would give them, they couldn't stop quite as fast and it would give more time for that noose to catch them. And then uh, string them up like that. All right, so we needed a visual indicator that was visible from the road, and I'll show you the road here in a second, but it's, we're on this uh, peak with this deck here. And so we want an indicator that there is an issue. Um, so we borrowed this reflective blanket, and uh, I wanted to get that up to where it could move and blow in the wind and reflect light in a bunch of different directions. But I figured at the bottom, if I could get a little bit of an audible uh, signal of some sort as well that was a little bit different than what might be normal that might be good so we hung uh, kind of like a pot or a spatula in a skillet here so when it blows around it kind of clanks there it's not as loud as I was hoping but that's what we got I guess uh, it could be a relaxing wind chime also so we've got multi-purpose since it's survival so when I'm sunbathing out here in a survival situation, I've got something reminding me of home. Well, the other thing we could have done probably is hung the pot so it's up off the ground and when they were playing together it made a maiden right. more noise. Right. So.
but uh, how are you gonna see that and be like, I need to go check that out? No. No. They're gonna see it and be like, okay, for whatever reason, there's a giant orange panel up there, and they're not gonna think twice about it. Really, dude? <laughs> Bear, are you gonna take that? <laughs> it's funny because he's done that to Ralph. All in all, the basic survival class at Rock Castle was awesome for everybody of such a wide um, berth of experience levels. It was really neat. Um, Rock Castle is an incredible area, an incredible venue. They have a lot to offer. Um, a lot of land, a lot of different terrain. They also have shooting, lodging, they have a winery, golf, they have everything there. So it's really a unique place to take a class. Now this basic class is, I think, the most, the most basic class that Justin teaches. I would take a five-year-old there to his class in a heartbeat. I think that anybody who has the capacity to learn has the capacity to leave there knowing more than what they did when they came, even if they already know a whole lot. I'm hoping to take some more classes down there. Justin's a great guy. I think he's a great teacher. Um, he's, he's not out there to get in people's faces. He's not out there to prove how cool he is. He's got the experience. Um, you know, I, he, he's, he survived alone by himself, obviously, as you saw on History Channel's Alone. Uh, he's been there, he's done that, and all around he's a good guy, and he has a little bit different understanding about survival than your typical survivalist because he's not a primitive survival teacher, although he does know a lot of primitive stuff. So, what you get when you go to Rock Castle, no matter what your skill level, um, it, there's just something for everybody. This basic class was awesome. I'm glad I got to take my sisters there. Sadly, I didn't get to bother them about uh, getting a report on what they learned that was new, but I know that they learned a lot. All in all, it was a great time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put links below, not only to Rock Castle, but also to ways to contact Justin. Um, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. Please share it. Uh, Rock Castle is a really great untapped resource right now. Not enough people know that this awesome training um, opportunity is out there. Um, it's great, it's local, it's South Central Kentucky. So whether you're in Louisville or Nashville or Lexington, um, Bowling Green's big, this whole area has a lot of people right around here and uh, Rock Castle really is kind of a diamond in the rough or a hidden gem uh, that people just don't know about. They've got a lot of land, a lot of cool stuff. So make sure to check them out and uh, check Justin out. And I look forward to talking to you in the comment section. I hope that you have a blessed day. He ain't dead smart. Played by the United States Marine Fife and the Drum Corps.